Well, let's begin once again with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created. Now shalt renew the face of the earth. And let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same Spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, Mother of Mercy, St. Joseph, St. Louis de Montfort, us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. <clears throat> uh, just for my own information, uh, I was wondering how many of you made the retreat with me uh, here three years ago? Okay. okay, that's good to know. Not many. Have you made a retreat before? Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I would uh, feel somewhat remiss if I preached a retreat and did not devote mm, at least one talk to our Blessed Mother, Mary. Um, and uh, since this is a retreat, which has as its theme the spiritual battle of our time, I want to get around to talking about Our Lady's place in the spiritual warfare that we are now in. Um, <clears throat> one time they were uh, airing my Lenten mission series on EWTN, and I got uh, a letter from a nice Baptist lady in Oklahoma. I want to share this with you. Um, she wrote this, I found EWTN on my TV in February, and Lent was being observed. My first time learning about Lent is my church doesn't observe it. To me, it was a wonderful season of renewal. I watched often. I saw four of your talks. I saw the one you preached explaining why Catholics revere Mary. I hadn't heard the why before. I was quite interested. In one place, you reminded me of a favorite scripture I have heard many times in my 80 years of life, where, from the cross, Jesus gave the care of his mother to St. John. The thought came to me as you spoke. Mary really knew all Jesus' disciples. She lived among them as we do our friends. It seemed so real. Suddenly, I smelled the odor of roses. I could feel the pressure of a small wind holding the odor around me for several minutes, then slowly drift away. The house was closed. There was no way a wind could have blown in. There were no roses in the house. It's only me. The odor definitely came as a result of the words that I heard in my thoughts at the time. It left me a wonderful memory. End quote. Well, I always say that I attribute my vocation, my call to the priesthood, Uh, to the power of the Holy Rosary and the intercession of our Blessed Mother. There's no question in my mind that had it not been for Our Lady's influence, her profound influence in my life, that I would not be here today, a priest. There's no question. Uh, When I was a teenager in junior high and high school, I had a friend. uh, His name is Tony. And we were good friends and classmates. We used to pal around together after school and visit each other's homes quite a bit. We had a lot of classes together. We played the same sports on the same teams, and uh, we graduated from high school together, then went on to college. We were a couple years at Temple together. Uh, We had gotten to be close friends in those days. When we were in high school, uh, Tony never went to church. He had no affiliation with any denomination that I ever knew about, but while we were in college, he had gotten involved with a very fundamentalist Protestant prayer group and Bible study. And we used to get into these big discussions about the Bible. Now, neither one of us knew what we were talking about, but uh, Tony started bringing up the subject all the time, and the good that came out of that was that it gave me some incentive to start reading the Bible so that I could at least have some basic knowledge of what it was all about. And I was reading it out of curiosity for the most part. But for my Bible study, I chose the old Douay Reims version which my mother had uh, there at home. And the Douay Reims version, you may know, has a wonderful, concise Catholic commentary in it. By the grace of God, that turned out to be one of the best things that I ever did. 
reading the sacred scriptures really planted the seeds of my vocation to the priesthood. And in so many ways, more ways than I can describe to you, it changed my life. It changed my whole way of looking at life. Uh, you know, when I began to read the sacred scriptures, um, the more exciting it became for me. And I love history in any case, but, uh, um, but when I began to read the Old Testament and through the New, all of a sudden, the pieces began to fit together. It all began to make sense to me, and I knew that for me, there was no turning back. You know, the truth is compelling. And here we've got the inspired word of God, and it changed my way of thinking and feeling and acting. And, uh, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, speaks to our hearts, the inspired word, the sacred scriptures. So think of that combination. You know, I've, I've always heard it said, in the spiritual life, there's a very basic formula, simple equation, right? The Holy Spirit plus Mary brings forth Jesus Christ just as it did at Nazareth, right? That should make sense to you because Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? <laughs> well, um, while all this was going on, Tony started thinking about becoming a minister. And uh, when he finished college, he enrolled in a seminary there in the Philadelphia area. And the seminary he enrolled in just happens to be one of the most anti-Catholic institutions in the whole country. Uh, it is to this day a bastion of strict, rigorous Protestant fundamentalism, strict Calvinism, staunchly, vehemently anti-Catholic. Uh, now, I didn't know any of this at the time, and I didn't know what Tony was doing, and I really didn't care, because after all, I had my own plans and my own future to think about. And at that time, of course, I knew very little about the controversies between Catholics and Protestants. Now, Tony knew that I was a Catholic, and that had never been an issue between us before, but one day, Tony called me on the phone, and he invited me to come to a party, a little social gathering he was having with some of his new circle of friends, friends from his new prayer group. And this, I was told, uh, was an ecumenical prayer group, <clears throat> a non-denominational kind of gathering, you know, just good fellowship and all that stuff. Now, I can see by the reaction that I am getting from some of you that uh, you have had the same experience that I have. You know where this is going, right? Okay. When I got there, I was foolish enough to accept the invitation. When I got there that Saturday night, I found out very quickly that it was a non-denominational gathering as long as you were not Catholic, all right? <laughs> Now, this bunch found out that I was a Catholic and not ashamed of it. It was like an icy chill came over the room. They were very friendly toward me at first, but when they found out that I was a Catholic, all that changed very quickly into what you might call passive hostility, <laughs> polite antagonism. And I mean the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. This was my first experience of anti-Catholicism. This was a very uncomfortable, awkward situation for me and for them. And not knowing what else to do with the true papist in their midst, uh, they decided to close in for a quick kill, <laughs> like a pack of theological wolves. And they kept on bringing up all the old, predictable, lame, convoluted arguments against the Catholic Church, and I kept on shooting them down one by one. <laughs> and they were becoming more and more frustrated with me at every passing moment. Now, if you have ever been in a situation like this, you know that trying to defend the Catholic faith to dyed in the wool fundamentalists is kind of like being an American in Iran. <clears throat> well, not that extreme. Maybe Pakistan. All right? Um, uh, you know, in, in, in the Islamic world, in so many places, all that they know about America is what they have heard from their own leaders, the Islamic radicals, the imams, the mullahs. America is the great Satan, right? That's, what, that's all that they know. You don't cut through years of that brainwashing very easily. Hmm? Well, back then, I didn't know my faith all that well, but I knew it well enough to try to defend it. And when Tony and his friends realized that they were getting nowhere with me, they decided to try to make one last attempt one final assault, one last argument, 
They were going to fire the ultimate weapon, drop the big bomb. And what do you think that would be? Mary. Mary, of course. Mary, Mary, Mary. They attacked devotion to Our Lady. Now, there's nothing unusual about that, and that's exactly what you would expect um, from such people. But what struck me, what astonished me about this particular group, and I'm talking about this group and this group only, right, uh, was the fact they had this terrible aversion, repugnance, an actual hostility, not just to Marian devotion, but to our Blessed Mother herself. All right? Now, um, what I am describing is not representative of Protestants in general. Right? Don't get me wrong. Right? Uh, I am not trying to paint all Protestants with the same brush. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? There are literally tens of thousands of different Protestant denominations from the, uh, the mainline churches to the storefront churches. And uh, I would have to say that in general, in my travels, I have found that of late, um, you know, Protestant people seem to be much more open to Marian devotion in many ways than they have been in the past. It's just my experience. Um, a pastor friend of mine, a good priest friend of mine, uh, um, was uh, having lunch. He took me to lunch with uh, a friend of his, a Baptist minister, and the subject got around to Mary. And I remember this, uh, this minister saying at one point, you know, for all these years, we thought you Catholics had said too much about Mary, and then we came to realize that we had said too little. Hmm? That was great. But again, back to this particular group that I'm talking about. They had this awful aversion, hostility to our Blessed Mother herself. They became agitated. I mean visibly incensed at the very sound of her holy name. Now, I explained to them clearly the distinction between the worship, the adoration we give to God alone, the Holy Trinity, and the honor we give to Mary and the saints, but they did not want to hear that. They were not going to accept that because obviously they wanted to go on believing that Catholics are idolaters. They had come to feel very comfortable in that belief, and they were not going to let it go. It's like the old saying, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> right? Then they told me what they think of our Blessed Mother. And this blew me away, and I'll never forget it. They were very flippant about it. What she means to them. Hmm? They told me that as far as their faith is concerned... Mary is nothing, nothing. She was just a body, nothing more than a body, a vessel God made use of to bring Jesus Christ into the world. They said, theoretically, it could have been any woman. Any woman could have served the same purpose just as well. God just happened to choose this one named Mary. And all the while I was thinking, <laughs> what kind of theology is this? How incredibly shallow they are intellectually. How incredibly weak their understanding of the mysteries of the faith is. The incarnation, the hypostatic union, the virgin birth, the theology of redemption, the perfections of God. How incredibly superficial their knowledge was. This was not just bad theology, it was worse than that. To me, this was actually perverse, twisted. To hear it said that the mother of our Savior is nothing. To hear her life, her faith, her sorrows, her incomparable holiness, her perfect virtues reduced to insignificance. Triviality is one of the most outrageous errors that I've ever heard. And the sad part was that uh, they were simply too blind to see it. Now, I know this was not their intention. They were not trying to be offensive, but I took this to be not just an insult to my faith, myself as a Catholic, uh, not just an insult to Our Lady, but ultimately an insult to Christ himself. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to make this clear to you. Um, I don't mean to seem in any way antagonistic or uncharitable. I am not anti-fundamentalist. I'm just anti-anti-Catholic, right? There's a distinction, right? 
you've got to wonder. But some of these people, good, well-meaning people, that having been said, do they honestly believe they could honor our Lord by belittling and trivializing his mother? No way. It's common sense. Now, the sad part of this was that turned out to be one of the last times that I saw Tony. And that night turned out to be the end of our long friendship. More than 25 years have passed. And, uh, I know that he got married and he's got a family. He became a minister. He got ordained that he has a, he has a church and a congregation somewhere in North Jersey. But we never got together again. And I wonder if we could ever have been friends again. And I guess it could not have been otherwise. But you know what? It doesn't bother me at all. Um, Why? Because they had insulted our mother. The mother of our personal Lord and Savior. The queen and mother of all Christians. To me, this was very deadly, serious business. And you know, there are some things in life that are far more important than mere human friendship. Yes, in all things, at all times, we've got to practice Christian charity. And I'm all in favor of ecumenism. It is good and necessary. But we can't forget that true ecumenism has got to be founded upon mutual respect, mutual interests, not insults and offense. Friendship, true friendship, that, I think, is another matter altogether. And for me, true friendship has got to be based upon common goods, common bonds, For me, that common bond has got to be the truth. For me, when it comes to friendship, there can be no unity at the expense of the truth. Just my opinion. Hmm? This was about the mother of God, the mother of the church, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, the Immaculate Conception, the Ark of the New Covenant. What is at issue here is the truth. The dignity of womanhood, motherhood, nothing less than the honor of God. It's common sense. It's human nature. It's the way that we are. The great Protestant writer C.S. Lewis understood this very well. He said this about devotion to the Virgin Mary. Quote, the Roman Catholic beliefs on that subject are held not only with the ordinary fervor that attaches to all sincere religious belief, but very naturally with a peculiar and, as it were, chivalrous sensibility that a man feels when the honor of his mother or his beloved is at stake, end quote. Hmm? So, how true it is. Most of us tend to think very highly of our mothers. Hmm? If you brought a friend home to meet your family and that person proceeded to show disrespect or contempt towards your mother, chances are you would not be friends for very long, and I would suggest to you, uh, so it is with our Lord. When we were kids... Remember the quickest way to start a fight in the playground? Insult the other kid's mother. That would always do it. Right? This has to be understood. The Lord Jesus Christ loves his holy mother with an infinite love more than any son ever loved a mother or ever will. And he honors her with the greatest, the most perfect honor a son can ever give. He has given her an incomparable degree of heavenly glory. He has crowned her the queen of heaven. He has clothed her in the sun, in the moon, crowned her with 12 stars. That is about as biblical as you can get. Hmm? Um, you know, I've always wondered about this. It's kind of like saying to our Lord, we love you. We accept you as our personal Lord and Savior. Come and abide with us forever. Come into our lives, come into our hearts and our homes. <laughs> Just don't bring your mother around here. <laughs> right, we have no use for her. No time for her. All she does is get in the way. We don't want to see her or hear about her. Don't want to be bothered with her. We don't even want the mention of her name. She means nothing to us, but oh Lord, we want you. <laughs> right? How could that ever be pleasing to the Son of God and the Son of Mary? Just my opinion, for what it's worth. <laughs> Not to say that I'm the opinionated type, as you know. I, I, all right? Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen used to say that in the mind of Almighty God, there are two images 
two visions of each one of us. First, God sees us as we are. Then he sees us as we could be, as he wants us to be. So for all of us, the objective in the spiritual life is to make those two images in the mind of Almighty God to be one. From all eternity, there has only been one human person for whom God has only had one image. Mary. God made something great happen in Mary. The greatest event in the history of the world, the incarnation, took place within her virginal womb. Mary's virginal womb became the bridal chamber for heaven and earth. Divinity and humanity were joined together, wed in a kind of mystical marriage. That is something God intends to be known and understood and honored. Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh, true God and true man, took his sacred humanity, the bridge between heaven and earth from the holy humanity of the Blessed Virgin. He is truly flesh from her flesh, blood from her blood. And in this sense, we are profoundly related, profoundly close to her in Holy Communion, in the Holy Eucharist. She is the sinless, spotless, uncorrupted Ark of the New Covenant, chosen by God before time began, not at random, not by chance, but by the sovereign will of God. And no human person ever loved God as much as Mary does. God did not choose just anyone to be the virgin mother of the Redeemer. He chose Mary. Mary is the mother specially chosen by God, prepared by God, informed by God to be his own. Now, friends, there is nothing so difficult to understand about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. I can explain it so the most fundamental fundamentalist can get it, get it easily. If you just think of it like this. Hmm? God created his own mother. Did he not? If you could create your own mother, how would you make her? I know how I would make my mother all beautiful, all holy, all pure, all immaculate. That is exactly what God did. Mary's perfect faith response to God's call, her perfect obedience to God's holy will, countered and reversed the disobedience of Eve and set into motion the events that would make the Paschal mystery a reality. That is something that God intends to be known and understood and honored. The point is this. Mary said yes to God, an eternal yes that shook the heavens and the earth and changed the world forever. Great things happen when you say yes to God. When you make the personal sacrifice to conform your life totally to God's wisdom and will, with all your heart and soul, you are imitating Mary's faith, hope, Love and courage. You are placing yourself at the foot of the cross. That's what makes a saint. See, a saint is someone who not only accepts God's will or is resigned to God's will in some minimal way. A saint is someone who truly seeks God's will, loves God. God's will, embraces God's holy will, truly loves and wills what God wills, even if what God wills is the cross. Although we may not understand how and why of things until the next life. Mm -hmm. Mary entrusted herself completely to God, holding nothing back from him, ready to be his perfect instrument no matter what the cost, no matter what the consequences. God is the divine artist. Mary is the model, the masterpiece. And do you think that a great artist is insulted or offended when his masterpiece is admired and honored? No way. To embrace the Christian life is to do exactly what Mary did. 
to say yes to God. It means total abandonment to divine providence. It is, in a sense, to say to God, I am the stone, you be the sculptor. I am the clay, you be the potter. I am the instrument, you be the composer. I am the canvas, you be the painter, the master artist of my life. To be able to understand the greatness of Mary's fiat, that is her perfect faith response to God's call. I think it is necessary to understand what Mary was risking, what she had to lose by saying that eternal yes. By saying, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done unto me according to thy word. You have to understand the customs and the culture of the ancient Hebrews, their attitudes toward marriage and human sexuality. And needless to say, in first century Palestine, it was not like it is today in our American pop culture, right? where most people seem to have the idea that uh, marriage is temporary, spouses are disposable, fidelity, chastity, optional, sex, recreational, just so much fun and games to gratify yourself with no necessary relationship to human life, love, divorce rate, about 50%, cohabitation a norm, single parenthood, pregnancy out of wedlock, the order of the day. Now, now, that kind of licentiousness was an abomination to the first century Hebrews. Sexual immorality, marital infidelity was a very, very serious matter to the Jews of our Lord's day. Unlike the people of our time, they sought for what it really is, grave sin, what it is in the sight of Almighty God. The law of Moses pres prescribed very severe, dire penalties, especially for women who were thought to be unfaithful. And of course, in extreme cases, it could have meant the death penalty. Think of the woman caught in adultery in the Gospel of St. John. Hmm? What would have happened to that woman had our Lord not been there? Hmm? She could have been stoned to death. Even today, in the Islamic world, under Sharia law, women often are stoned to death on a mere suspicion of being unfaithful. Can you imagine the risk that Mary was taking by consenting to be the virgin mother of God's only begotten son, by saying yes to the archangel Gabriel? She knew what it meant for a girl who was betrothed or already given in marriage to be found with child by another. For such a girl, it could have meant the loss of her reputation, the loss of a husband, the loss of her ability to marry any respectable man, disgrace upon her family, ostracism, banishment from the community, the ruin of her life, and maybe even death. Mary was ready to risk all that and more for the love of God. Her trust in God was immediate, with no reservations, no doubts, no hesitation. It was totally courageous absolutely heroic. When St. Gabriel came to call our Blessed Mother to be the Virgin Mother of the Redeemer, he spoke to her in words that no angel had ever addressed to a human being before. He said, Hail. Hail, full of grace. That was a heavenly salute. A salute of the angels to Mary. Mary, full of grace before baptism, full of grace before our Lord's birth. What better evidence could we need for the reality of the Immaculate Conception than the words of the archangel who stands before God's throne? And if the archangel who stands before God's throne, God's own messenger, could honor Mary with a heavenly salute, tell me why any Christian should ever be ashamed or afraid to give Mary the honor that she deserves. The honor that is rightly due to her is the virgin mother of God's only begotten son. She is the one full of grace. The Greek word used by the evangelist St. Luke in his gospel is kikarotamene, which means exactly that full of grace, to be grace-filled. Now, you know, some of these modern translations drive me nuts. 
Hmm? My, um, you know, in the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, uh, the, the Annunciation, um, they have St. Gabriel saying to Our Lady, Rejoice, O highly favored one, rather than full of grace, right? It drives me nuts. Now, there is a great distinction, as you should know, right? Now, um, um, a lot of people are predicting um, that the Detroit Tigers are highly favored to win the pennant this year. All right? That does not mean the Tigers are full of grace. All right? Mm hmm. Again, common sense, right? Mary is the perfect instrument in God's hands, the perfect mother of his only begotten son, and there are no words that can be spoken on the face of this earth that can ever diminish the greatness of that in the sight of Almighty God. Now, we call Abraham our father in faith because Abraham was ready to sacrifice his beloved son at God's command. And we know that the sacrifice... God asked of Abraham was only a test. It's never carried out. Recall that the angel of the Lord prevented the bloody sacrifice of his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. But the sacrifice that God asked of Mary, the sacrifice of her only son, was carried out before her very eyes on the bloody cross, on the blood-soaked soil of Calvary. And that is where the words of the prophet Simeon were fulfilled in her. At the presentation of our Lord in the temple 40 days after his birth, Simeon foretold that a sort of sorrow would pierce her heart so the hearts of many could be revealed. Recall that the Roman soldier thrust a lance into the side of our Lord and pierced his sacred heart, and there flowed out blood and water. Symbolic of the price of our salvation, Jesus was already dead there on the cross. Jesus never felt that cutting blade that pierced his divine heart there on Calvary. The one who bore the terrible pain of that blow was Mary. In a spiritual sense, the point of that spear pierced her maternal heart as she looked on in horror. On Calvary, Mary made the greatest sacrifice God could ever call upon a mother to make. She suffered the worst pain a mother could ever endure. And that is why we rightly call Mary our mother in faith. And her immaculate heart is the heart of devotion. The heart of devotion. One of my favorite books on Our Lady is True Devotion, written by St. Louis de Montfort. If... Um, you want to have some insight into the role of our Blessed Mother um, in the spiritual battle of the latter days, all you need do is to read the works of St. Louis de Montfort, especially True Devotion. And to sum it up, uh, St. Louis de Montfort said something to this effect. I'm paraphrasing here. He said, the greatest saints will be those most greatly devoted to Our Lady. Because only those Catholics who were truly devoted to Our Lady would be preserved free from all theological error. Hmm? He says something to this effect also. The most sure way to recognize a priest of bad doctrine is in one who has no devotion to our Blessed Mother. And for a priest to have disdain for devotion to Our Lady is, he said, the sign of reprobation. Hmm? Did you ever in your experience come across a priest who wanted nothing to do with Our Lady? They're nuts. Huh? There was a story, I'll tell you, not to digress, but... Uh, um, there was a story about a newly ordained priest um, in a diocese in Kentucky, and he came out of a very wacky seminary uh, in that part of the country. Um, and, uh, I mean, he was taught to have nothing to do with Marian devotion or the rosary or anything like that. 
Uh, so in celebrating uh, the Feast of the Assumption, the Solemnity of the Assumption, um, this priest went into the pulpit to give his homily, carrying with him three props. A small statue of Our Lady, a rosary, and a trash can. Hmm? And he proceeded to tell everyone that devotion to our Blessed Mother is nothing more than a sign of infantile pietism. Not something that mature Christians should be doing. We've got to move beyond these old superstitions, pietistical devotions, you see. Then he said that uh, Vatican II did away with all that, don't you know? And then for dramatic effect, he held up the statue of Our Lady in one hand, trash can in the other, and he slammed the statue of Our Lady into the trash can, then the rosary behind it, right? Um, two years later, that young priest had left the priesthood, and uh, he got himself arrested out in California and did two years in San Quentin because of a sex scandal. Mm -hmm. huh? Again, St. Louis de Montfort's words are as relevant today as they ever were. But uh, he said this, these things about Mary's part in the spiritual battle of our time. Right? Um, he was of the opinion that the greatest saints would be those of the latter days because the saints of bygone eras would have to defeat Satan chained. But the saints of the latter days would have to defeat Satan unchained. Let me, uh, let me quote uh, St. Louis de Montfort here on Our Lady's role in the last days. To Mary alone, God gave the keys of the cellars of divine love and the ability to enter the most sublime and secret ways of perfection and lead others along them. This means that the greatest saints... Those richest in grace and virtue will be the most assiduous in praying to the most blessed virgin, looking up to her as the perfect model to imitate and as a powerful helper to assist them. I said this will happen especially toward the end of the world, and indeed is soon, because Almighty God and His Holy Mother are to raise up great saints who will surpass in holiness most other saints as much as the cedars of Lebanon tower above little shrubs. These great souls, filled with grace and zeal, will be chosen to oppose the enemies of God who are raging on all sides. They will be exceptionally devotion, devoted to the Blessed Virgin, illumined by her light, strengthened by her food, guided by her spirit, supported by her arm, sheltered under her protection. They will fight with one hand and build with the other. With one hand, they will give battle, overthrowing and crushing heretics and their heresies, schismatics and their schisms, idolaters and their idolatries, sinners and their wickedness. With the other hand, they will build the temple of the true Solomon in the mystical city of God. By word and example, they will draw all men to a true devotion to her, and through this will make many enemies, but will also bring about many victories and much glory to God alone. In these latter times, Mary must shine forth more than ever in mercy, power, and grace. In mercy, to bring back and welcome lovingly the poor sinners and wanderers who are to be converted and return to the Catholic Church. In power, to combat the enemies of God who will rise up menacingly to seduce and crush by promises and threats all who oppose them. Finally, she must shine forth in grace to inspire and support the valiant soldiers and loyal servants of Jesus Christ who are fighting for his cause. Lastly, Mary must become as terrible as an army in battle array to the devil and his followers, especially in these latter times. For Satan, knowing he has but little time, even less now than ever, to destroy souls, intensifies his efforts and his onslaughts every day. He will not hesitate to stir up savage persecutions and set treacherous snares for Mary's faithful servants and children whom he finds more difficult to overcome than others. Thus, the most fearful enemy that God has set up against the devil is Mary, his holy mother. Hmm? Uh, listen to the voice of the saints. Hmm? 
I'm always fascinated with what the saints had to say about Our Lady. From the earliest days, right? From, you know, the most immediate successors of the apostles through every century. St. Ignatius of Antioch is the direct disciple of the Apostle St. Peter and St. John. He says, he who is devout to the Virgin Mother will certainly never lose his way. St. Irenaeus, bishop and martyr of the second century, wrote, the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. What the Virgin Eve had bound in unbelief, the Virgin Mary loosed through faith. St. Augustine, greatest theologian of the early church, said, Mary conceived Christ in her heart through faith before she ever conceived him in her womb. If all the tongues of all the men in all the world were to praise Mary throughout their entire lives, it would be far less than she deserves. St. Cyril of Alexandria, 5th century, champion of the faith of the Council of Ephesus, wrote this. That anyone could doubt that the right of the Holy Virgin to be called the Mother of God fills me with astonishment. Surely she must be the Mother of God if our Lord Jesus Christ is God and she gave birth to him. Our Lord's disciples may not have used those exact words, but they delivered to us the belief those words enshrined. This has also been taught to us by the Holy Fathers. St. Ambrose, 4th century, said, that the soul of Mary be in each of us to magnify the Lord, and the spirit of Mary be in each of us to rejoice in God. St. Methodius, apostle of Eastern Europe and Russia, wrote, He who said, Honor your father and your mother, that he might observe his own decree, gave all grace and honor to his own mother. St. Anselm of Canterbury, 12th century, said, The divine spirit, the love itself of the father and the son, came corporally into Mary, and enriching her with graces above all creatures, reposed in her and made her his spouse, the queen of heaven and earth. St. Thomas Aquinas said, The Blessed Virgin, by becoming the mother of God, received a kind of infinite dignity, because God is infinite. This dignity, therefore, is such a reality that a better is not possible, just as nothing can be better than God. St. Alphonsus Liguori, who wrote the classic work of uh, Marian spirituality, The Glories of Mary, said, She is truly our mother, not indeed carnally, but spiritually, of our souls and of our salvation. For she, by giving us Jesus, gave us true life. And afterwards, by offering the life of her son on Calvary for our salvation, helped bring us forth to the life of grace. You see, the saints believed, this is clear from studying their writings, the saints believed that God will never refuse the prayers of our Blessed Mother because she never refused God anything he asked of her when she was on earth, not even her only son. Last year, in October, I was invited to speak at um, the annual convention of the Chicago chapter of the Blue Army of Our Lady of Fatima. And when I got the invitation, I was all excited. I mean, I was all pumped up, you know. I thought, this is going to be great. There are going to be thousands of people there. To my great astonishment, um, there were only about 150 people at that conference. And, and of course, they rented space in a huge hotel ballroom. But there were less than 200 people present there. The vast majority of them were elderly women. And I was just amazed, amazed, because the message of Fatima is so incredibly important in our time. And it will be until it is fulfilled. You know that at Fatima, our Lady revealed many things to those three shepherd children, Francisco, Jacinta, and Lucia. She told them there would be wars, world war, persecutions of the church, the spread of atheism, the loss of countless souls, scandal, disobedience, and division in the church. The Holy Father would have much to suffer. 
But by far the most frightening thing that she showed to the children was the vision of hell. On July the 13th, 1917, she showed the children a vision of hell and she told them that souls were falling into hell by the thousands. Her exact words were that souls were falling into hell like snowflakes. That it was over 95 years ago. How terrifying it is. Now, because so many people have lost the faith, lost their sense of sin, lost their sense of God, we are seeing what is, in essence, the great apostasy. And I believe it is the great apostasy predicted in Scripture by the Apostle St. Paul. There is a desperate need for the world to accept the message of Our Lady of Fatima and the mercy that God offers through her intercession while there is still time. One uh, secular writer reflecting on the events of Fatima uh, dismissed it all again as, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, silly superstitions of ignorant uh, Catholics, you see, and uh, made the statement that uh, come 2017, the Fatima message will become the Fatima myth. Pope Benedict XVI has said that 2017 will be a very, very significant year for the church and for the world. He didn't say exactly what significance it would have, but I would ask you to consider this. Hmm? Think of what is coming in October of 2017. In October 2017, in the span of that one month, we will see the 100th anniversary of Our Lady's apparitions at Fatima. And the 100th anniversary of the miracle of the sun, Our Lady's final apparition. In that same month, we will also see the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Revolution responsible for an estimated 70 million deaths worldwide. Untold heartache. October of 2017 will also be the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Revolt. Hmm? Right? All in the span of that one month. Now, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who I've always considered to be a prophetic man, used to say, before the hand of God comes down upon the world, it always comes down upon the church. Well, it seems that the hand of God has come down upon the church in so many ways, especially through the scandals. that have done so much to destroy the public image of the church, and a priest in particular. But uh, he also said, Calamitous events come upon the church in 500-year intervals. So if uh, the words of Bishop Sheen were truly prophetic, we're due. Something is coming. Right? We don't know what, but we must be prepared, my friends. To me, the question has always been this. Why do we hear so many reports of our Blessed Mother appearing in so many different parts of the world, in, in recent centuries, and even in recent decades, places like Lourdes, Nock, Fatima, Akita. And, and of course, um, we have the uh, newly approved apparition site in Champion, Wisconsin, which is now being operated by the Fathers of Mercy. Mm -hmm. Um, why? Why so many apparitions? Why so many warnings? I believe it is because clearly Our Lady is the prophetess of our time. And she has never ceased to be our most loving mother. She is a mother whose love never grows cold. She never abandons her children. When a mother rushes to her children, it is because she knows they are in danger. Souls are in danger. Families are in danger. 
The church is in danger. Our country is in danger. Hmm? Um, let me say this to you. Um, I was up uh, at the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help uh, in Champion, Wisconsin, uh, which was approved about two years ago by Bishop David Ricken of the Diocese of Green Bay. And uh, it is the only approved Marian apparition site in the United States. Uh, but if you get a chance to visit, please take advantage of it because it is truly a blessed and amazing place. Uh, it's a simple and a humble place. Uh, where Our Lady appeared to Sister Adele Bryce in October of 1859. And uh, Our Lady appeared to Sister Adele only one time, but it was awesome. Our Lady predicted the coming of the Civil War, right? Two years later. Hmm? But the essence of the message was Sister Adele and her confreres were teaching sisters. The essence of the message at Champion from Our Lady of Good Help was the awesome, awesome responsibility for the spiritual formation and religious education of our young people and what the dire consequences would be if we fail to hand on the faith to them. Now we know what Our Lady was worried about, don't we? We see what has happened. The tremendous, colossal failure of Catholic education in the last 50 years, uh, which has gotten us into the mess we are in today. But uh, without going into that, uh, you know, I found the shrine of Our Lady of Good Help to be an amazing and, and truly blessed place where you really sense in a profound way the presence of Our Lady. And uh, when you go down into the crypt chapel, uh, which is almost like, you know, at this point, somebody's basement, which has been converted into a crypt chapel, and there is this magnificent statue of Our Lady, which stands on the exact site where Our Lady appeared to Sister Adele. And just to be in prayer in that little crypt chapel is, is an awesome thing. And uh, it is truly inspirational. If you get a chance to go there, by all means, take advantage of it. The rector there is my old friend, Father Peter Stryker, a uh, great guy. And uh, I can tell you, they are staying very, very busy there, uh, especially in the summertime. Um, in the summertime, they have been getting sometimes up to 1,000 pilgrims per day. Hmm? When I was there in October... It was just a steady stream of, uh, of uh, tour buses, pilgrims, um, um, seniors groups, um, school groups, students. But it was truly amazing. So if you get a chance, by all means, see it. Hmm? The bottom line is this, friends, before I close. Today, Our Lady is calling on us to become a great force of prayer and reparation in the world. And again, by the grace of God, she has given us the weapon to fight with in the spiritual battle of our time, and that weapon is the Holy Rosary. Sister Lucia dos Santos, uh, one of the three children Our Lady appeared to at Fatima, in one of the last interviews that she granted, said this, quote, most Holy Virgin, in these last times in which we live, has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the Holy Rosary to such an extent that there is no problem, no matter how difficult it is, in the personal life of each one of us or of our families or even of peoples and of nations which cannot be solved with a rosary. With a Holy Rosary, we will save ourselves. We will console our Lord and obtain the salvation of many souls. So we pray again tonight. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. Uh, we'll ask you just to check out uh, again the uh, CD sets that we have on the back table. And uh, we also have uh, the new Eucharistic rosaries. And when you see them, you will know immediately why they are called Eucharistic rosaries. Right? The Our Father beads are shaped as drops of blood in red. And, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Mother of Pearl uh, Hail Mary beads uh, are shaped as the, uh, the disc 
right, to represent the sacred host and the blessed sacrament. So check those out. It is your spiritual weapon. And um, there was another talk that I would like to be able to give during this retreat, but I will not have the time to do that. And uh, the title of that talk is, What Do You Know About Marriage? Um, I brought about 20 copies along, and I'm going to give them away. Uh, we don't have enough for everyone, but uh, if uh, uh, we could uh, just give away maybe one per family or one per couple, right? And uh, uh, to, uh, to our young people, I think we'll have enough to go around. So uh, you're welcome to stop by the table and uh, pick up a free copy of uh, the talk entitled, What Do You Know About Marriage?